<laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, first of all, to Lundy, and welcome to St. Helen's Church, and welcome to the Green Festival. I hope uh, all of you would have heard that this is happening at the moment. It runs from two days ago right through to the 11th of September, throughout the summer, and we've got quite a lot planned to happen. Uh, you won't necessarily be here to see it, unfortunately, but you'll certainly be witnessing what's happening this week, when you will have seen in this church that we've converted it to a pop-up marine laboratory. And I'm delighted to say that we have people from the Porcupine Marine Natural History Society here, um, the North Devon Coastwise are here, uh, also uh, people undertaking the Darwin Tree of Life project being undertaken by the Natural History Museum from London and also people coming from the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth. So they're all here at the moment. Um, to start with, they're undertaking an intertidal bioblitz, which is effectively trying to record everything they find on the shore, all around the island. Um, and then that will continue on Monday and Tuesday below the waves. So they will be diving and collecting what they can underwater as well. And for the Darwin Tree of Life project, they're very keen to get samples of some of the specimens found here um, to be able to record their DNA. It's a very major project happening throughout the British Isles, and they're hoping to catalogue as many as 70,000 species, all animals and plants, um, and uh, to catalogue their DNA for really for future reference as much as anything. So it's a, it's a national project, and I'm delighted to say they decided to come to London to collect some of their marine specimens. But throughout the rest of the summer, we've got a number of activities happening. Um, we'll have these weekly talks, which tonight is going to be the first one. We'll also, and we also have a diving program throughout the summer, um, trying to undertake various projects, looking at sea fans, the health of sea fans, for instance, um, recording uh, the fauna and flora from uh, kelp, holdfasts, and stipes, um, looking at uh, different sponges as well, and cut corals. And then a major project we're undertaking is looking at how effective the no take zone is at the moment. Um, the no take zone was set up in 2003 and hasn't really been monitored uh, since about 2007. So we're very keen to see if it is still proving its effectiveness. And by that I mean it seems to be uh, certainly where lobsters are able to grow bigger, more numerous, and the same with edible crabs. Um, so in fact, new no-take zones are proving to be very effective areas. In effect, really being left to naturalize again. It's, it's all the rewilding you like, that's happening now on land much more prevalently. So um, those are some of the projects we're doing. Uh, we've also got a number of items for sale in the shop here on the island, um, and uh, we've got displays up, as I hope you've seen, and a number of other things that are happening. So I hope you will take part, um, if you can, there are various places around the island as to how to do that. And of course, there's the website as well, which gives many people the chance to find out what's going on. So, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker. And I'm delighted to say that we have Dr. Keith Hiscott, who is retired, a retired um, member of the Marine Biological Association, and has known Lundy since 1969, when he first died here. And has been in touch with the island ever since in terms of its marine management. So, what we're going to do, Pete, would you like to just come up to the front here for a moment? How we're going to start off this evening is that uh, I'm going to have a chat with Keith, which hopefully you'll be able to then hear, and um, we'll then lead on to Keith's talk. The chat initially will give you a bit more of an idea of who Keith is and what he's done in his life to give you a bit more idea of what he's he's managed to do. So uh, I will take the seat beside him and we'll start off uh, our little conversation. So I've known Keith uh, for ooh, since 1983 when I first came to Lundy and uh, 
He led, has led a number of expeditions uh, at that time and also did work for the Nature Conservancy Council. Um, but I'd like to just take you back a little bit further, Keith. I know you're a local lad, born in Ilfracombe, but uh, can you tell us how your interest in marine biology started? Well, I think I first came to Lundy probably when I was about five because my father used to come over here and do plumbing work on the island. And uh, I've got a photograph on one of the Campbell's paddle steamers um, from about 1952, something like that, um, of myself, my brother and my father, probably a picture taken by either my elder sister or my mother uh, coming across on the paddle steamer. Um, so that was probably a first visit to Lundy. But in fact, my father was very keen on going out on the shore and ca catching prawns and lobsters and things like that. And I'd go out and see things like sea anemones. Uh, and I got fascinated by the fact that Ilfracombe was a premier location in Victorian times for marine natural history. And the local library had the books of Philip Henry Goss. And you could actually see from his writing where he'd been in the African region and what he'd found in the way of sea anemones and corals. And I was particularly fascinated by the fact that there were corals in British waters. I thought corals just occurred in the tropics. So I went out on the shores around Ilfracombe, um, low water, looking to see what I could find and see if I could find the same things as, as Philip Henry Goss in the middle of the 19th century. Um, so it all started from there. And then um, I, I was very surprised once when I was in the lower sixth form at um, Ilfram Grammar School and the deputy headmaster came round handing out university application forms. And he gave me one. And I thought, oh, what's, what's this all about, university? <laughs> but anyway, I filled it in and I got a place at Westfield College, University of London, um, where very fortunately, um, the senior lecturer, who was a bit of a dragon, actually wanted to learn to dive. And so all of a sudden we had the use of the departmental van to go off to Pembrokeshire, go diving. I got the workshops to make me a, a Perspex housing for a single lens reflex camera and things like that. And with friends and you know, people from Westfield College, uh, I came over in 1969 to dive for the first time. It wasn't the first time I camped on Lundy, that was 1967 with school friends. So we camped on Lundy then. But 1969, we came over, which is, of course, a real transition year for Lundy. And by chance, we were over here when the church dedication service was being held um, with the changeover to the ownership to the National Trust with the Landmark Trust taking on management. And I was able to talk to John Smith, who passed me on to his agent, Ian Granger, about the possibility of a marine nature reserve. Have we got there, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have. We got there a, a bit beyond. But that's great. Um, so, you, with a number of colleagues, you helped persuade mm -hmm. others that the voluntary marine neck reserve was a, was a good idea. Um, why do you think the waters around Lundy needed that sort of protection? Well, first of all, it, it wasn't me that was starting the ball rolling. Uh, it was basically Heather and Ron Machin and John Lamerton, who then worked as an assistant regional officer for the Nature Conservancy Council. Um, so they were writing in the Devon Wildlife Trust uh, report and uh, booklet or whatever, uh, annual report, um, about the idea of marine reserves, which were gaining a lot of traction worldwide. Marine reserves, marine parks, people saw a need for them because of various degrading activities which were taking place, spoiling coral reefs and so on. And I think the thought was, well, why not us as well? Um, but I think there were reasons that people were concerned in particular about what divers were doing, what recreational divers were doing, taking souvenirs, taking lobsters, taking spiny um, uh, lobsters and, and so on. Um, and there was a review which said, no, nah, we don't need uh, marine nature reserves in Britain. But we carried on pushing for them because we saw a need in terms of not just reducing human impacts, but also in terms of having places which were as close as possible to natural, where you could follow natural change, where you could see what was normal. Um, and, and Lundy fitted the bill very well. And it fitted the bill also because as an island with west, east facing coast, north for coast, strong tidal currents, strong wave action, intermittent wave action. It had an enormous variety of habitats. So it was a place which 
um, from then until now is really very, very important for the range of marine habitats. Um, do you want to go on to the sunset cup coral? Yeah. Go on. Yes, tell us about the sunset. Go on the sunset cup coral. So as I say, I organized a group of friends to come over here diving in 1969 when Don Shires um, was organizing the diving on Lundy and basically had the diving rights uh, from Albion Harmon carried on after his death um, to dive from Lundy. So nervously, I went to see him in North London and arranged to come over with these friends. We camped, uh, we brought our basic diving equipment and we were taken out in boats and we went diving at just a few sites. But the last day we dived on the knoll pins and um, I was impressed by the variety and color of the marine life on the knoll pins. And then we came around a corner and I was faced with this wall full of bright yellow, I thought, sea anemones. And I thought, I've never seen that before. Um, I've been diving in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and Southwest um, Ireland and so on, not seen anything like it. And I sort of touched them and they were hard. They had a calcareous skeleton. They were corals. And it took me until May the next year to actually through the normal routes of communication in those days, writing letters in handwriting, sending um, specimens through the post to a specialist in Belgium uh, to find out that they were a Mediterranean cup coral, uh, which we call these days the sunset cup coral. Um, and first record for Britain, it remains a nationally rare species. So there are ways of calculating rarity <coughs> in marine species and the sunset cup coral is still nationally rare and it is still a very special feature of, of Lundy. But there were lots of other things as well and we carried on from there. Mm. And we got some uh, photographs of the yellow cup corals, I think of the sunset cup corals up on some of the display boards we got here. But then you went on to do a PhD at the Menai Bridge Labs in North Wales. And uh, following that, you then got your first job. Was it at the Oriel Tulman Field Station? Well, not, not quite. <laughs> no, um, not the, um, the PhD at, at Menai Bridge was with Professor Dennis Crisp. And Professor Crisp was very keen that I'd do a project which would look at larval biology of sea furs, of hydrozoans. Um, and then he disappeared off to India for six months. And I couldn't get the blooming things to breed. I couldn't get the larvae. So when he came back, I'd already been doing, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of diving <coughs> around Lundy and around um, the uh, Anglesey and seeing the impact that different levels of wave action and tidal currents had on seabed marine life. I was diving. Diving was pretty brand new then. I had a clear field. So when he came back, um, I said, well, sorry, Prof, you know, the, the, the larval experiments haven't really worked, but I'm really finding out some very interesting things about subtidal ecology. And he'd been working on intertidal ecology as well with Alan Southwood. And so he let me change my PhD to look at the ecology of subliteral areas, subtidal areas in relation to water movement, wave action and tidal currents. And Lundy was one of the four sites which I had as one of my um, field survey sites. So, you know, that started me going on Lundy, but as well as that, we managed to get money from the Royal Society, the Lundy Field Society, and people's personal contributions, as you did in those days, voluntary um, expenses, uh, to come over in various taxonomic fields. In other words, specialists in worms, crustaceans, sea anemones and corals, uh, hydro, sorry, um, uh, amphipod crustaceans and such like, to prepare lists of species for the Lundy Field Society annual report. And those are published in the Lundy Field Society annual report um, and then led into a much better knowledge of what we have about the marine life present around Lundy. Good, so this was really part of your PhD, but then it developed into a job. <coughs> well, it did Wait, because all of a sudden, well, first of all, my first actual job after my PhD was um, so doing a surveillance study of rocky shores around Anglesey. So money from Shell, who had the uh, oil terminal on the north coast of Anglesey, and um, 
we would go out at all states, well, at high, low water of spring tides, which was first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening, which meant we could do two tides a day, which was still a drain on our time. Um, and so I joined that unit and we did our surveys. Um, and then uh, our job came up at the Field Studies Council Oil Pollution Research Unit uh, at Orielton Field Centre near Pembroke. And I got the job of assistant uh, director of that unit um, and started to do work to do with sorting samples from around oil rigs and so on. Never really took to that. But fortunately, at the same time, we're talking 1976, 1977 now, the Nature Conservancy Council discovered marine. Obviously, their main focus had been on terrestrial conservation and terrestrial nature reserves but they've been dragged kicking and screaming, I think, into uh, taking notice of issues to do with marine conservation and even the possibility of having statutory marine nature reserves. So I um, started doing a lot of survey work for them to find out what was where. Uh, and that was done with the Field Studies Council uh, right up until uh, 1987, when I was actually taken on the staff of the Nature Conservancy Council to head up their Marine Nature Conservation Review of Great Britain. So I, with my team of between 12 and 20 people, were basically traveling around Great Britain. Some of them were based in outposts like Newcastle and uh, various other uh, places, uh, Millport in the Firth of Clyde, uh, Stirling University, uh, to do the survey work. So that helped to give me a context, a, a GB context, if you like, to what I was seeing around Lundy. And Lundy was outstanding. So I continued to promote uh, Lundy, organised trips here. Uh, the Nature Conservancy Council paid for some of that work, leading up to when Robert was appointed as the Marine Liaison Officer, because the possibility of Lundy being a statutory Marine Nature Reserve was facilitated by the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act. So there we are. No, it's, uh, it's been an interesting development over that 50 years because Lundy, as many people now know, has become the first to be put forward for various things. So it's become the first statutory marine nature reserve and the first uh, no-take zone that we had um, and the first marine conservation zone more recently. So it's all been very positive in a way for Lundy. Have, have you noticed any more negative things perhaps that have happened around the island? Would you say the marine life is still as, as rich and as colourful as when you first saw it? Well, there have been changes, of course. Um, we resurveyed the intertidal areas that Leslie Harvey had surveyed in the late 1940s with his wife, Claire. And uh, we have an enormously good legacy from the Harveys of um, their field records and so on. Most of it in handwritten notes, some of it typed up, very little of it quantitative. Uh, very li little of it where you can go back and look at the actual numbers of individuals or species. But in 2008, when we did the uh, intertidal resurvey of their sites, we found more or less the same species, a um, few more, balanced out the few less, and perhaps less individuals, perhaps less density of um, some of the uh, some of the species. So in terms of change intertidally. No, not much. And the same with some of the subtitle areas. We haven't obviously got the records back, going back a long way. But there have also been some downturns. Um, unfortunately, pink sea fans were taken, uh, which are iconic species. Sounds very tropical, pink sea fans. They look very tropical. And were being taken uh, and dried as souvenirs in the late 1960s. Well, that didn't do the population any good. And then unfortunately, in the early 2000s, Lundy, as well as the whole of southwest England, was affected by a Vibrio bacterial disease and a lot of pink sea fans were killed off. Now, that might have been a bit of a trigger, um, which meant that they had difficulty recovering uh, because they aren't as abundant as they used to be. And I think that Vibrio bacterium, this is my own theory, affected other sea anemones and corals, which declined in abundance. And so, some of those were waiting to kick back. And what I would say to you is that in the marine environment, we are quite used to things disappearing for decades on end. So 40 years, 50 years, something disappears, and then it comes back. I mean, a lot of you know about bluefin tuna, which was overfished and which 
basically the WWF was predicting would become extinct in the North Atlantic. And then five years ago, they came back and now they're all over the place in the Southwest. So we get those decadal scale changes and what we hope is that, that some of the declines on Lundy fit into that. Uh, I'm going to hurry you along a bit. Well, yes, because a lot of this I'm covering later anyway, Robert. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you have to say all at all, but uh, you then went down to Plymouth, finishing with Peterborough, and you went down to Plymouth with the, and you created the Marlin program down there. Um, and could you just tell us a brief bit about how that is set up and what you wanted it to achieve? Well, if you recall, some of you, at the end of the 1990s, the internet was beginning to be used by people. A lot of people were saying, what's this in internet worldwide webby thing and, and so on? What's it all about? So that was the end of the 90s. But the then director of the NBA, Michael Whitfield, was very switched on to that sort of thing. And I could see ways of using this new tool for disseminating information to bring together data on what was where, survey work, with information on uh, the biology of species, which would tell us something about their sensitivity to human activities. And that's exactly what we did. Um, with, some, you know, with some bright young things, we, we produced the software and we produced the websites and it all went very quickly. Um, and the, Marlin web, the Marine Life Information Network website is now a very significant tool for management, uh, environmental protection and management uh, amongst the statutory agencies in their various guises. Um, so that's what I did. I moved down to Plymouth, um, first on secondment from English Nature and then employed by the Marine Biological Association. And then I actually retired, believe it or not, in 2007. Um, I was fed up with all the admin and so on, but I carried on doing work for them and I'm now an associate fellow, which means in my terms, I'm retired, but they still find me useful. <laughs> Good. Well, we've come right up to 50 years really since uh, you first started here at Lundy. Um, and uh, we would like very much to hear your talk now of what you're going to say. Could, so could you just give us the, the title of your talk, maybe, and then we'll get to see the slides. There it is. There. Oh, well, um, I need that to remind me what the title of the talk is. <laughs> so I'm going to um, stand up here, and I've been given this uh, marvelous pointer. I've got no idea where Robert got this from. Um, but I'm going to give you a flavor of what makes Lundy special. But I'm going to start with talking about the conservation story. And I'm sorry if um, this presentation repeats what Robert's got me to say, but I didn't know he was going to get me to say things. So can I have the next slide, please? So pre-1970s, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you to go forward when we go forward. Um, so. There were, dredging, there were dredging surveys being undertaken on the, off the east coast of Lundy um, before 1850. Uh, work of Edward Forbes and so on took dredge samples off the east coast of the island in 1848. And I'm told by colleagues who are here today from the Natural History Museum that there are specimens in the Natural History Museum which predate that from Lundy. But the first description of seashore wildlife are those by Philip Henry Goss, who I mentioned in relation to my interest in uh, seabed, uh, seashore marine life in North Devon. Uh, next one. And George Tugwell was another naturalist, and I just love this quotation. He returned from Lundy Shores in 1851, laden with all imaginable and unimaginable spoils. So the Victorian naturalists were very keen on trashing seashores, turning boulders over, using a strong-backed quarry man with a crowbar to turn boulders over, um, and uh, finding things. Charles Kingsley of um, the Water Babies fame, uh, who was based in Biddeford, he also was a very good marine naturalist. He wrote a book called Glaucus or the Wonders of the Shore, and he found the scarlet and gold star coral at Lundy, which Goss had described as new to science in 1853. Next, and Trogellus, uh, who I haven't got any pictures of, uh, collected seaweeds, made very, not comprehensive necessarily, but very good lists of seaweeds, um, 1934 to 1937. Next. But the first systematic studies of marine ecology at Lundy were the intertidal surveys undertaken by Leslie and Claire Harvey 
together with students of Exeter University in the late 1940s and very early 1950s. Um, and that's the records which are now held in the archives at the Marine Biological Association um, and which are very good. But as I say, unfortunately, he wasn't very quantitative. So when he uses descriptive terms like common or occasional, we don't know what he actually meant. And, and that would have helped tremendously. Uh, next slide. And then we start going underwater. But of course, we have to wait until diving. Um, and in the late 1960s, people were using fairly primitive diving equipment, scuba diving equipment. Um, and uh, David Irvine from the Polytechnic of North, North London and all these other people, uh, when I came over in 1969 with my friends from uh, Westfield College, um, this lot were here and, and they were collecting seaweeds and, and they were identifying them and they were writing uh, long lists of the species that they collected from the shore and underwater. So they got 298 species listed. So a bit more work, um, but 298 species of algae, which is a very good list. And they found this one. This is golden kelp. And you can see in a way why it's called golden kelp. It's got a very clean stipe. Our native or our northern kelp, as it's called, uh, the one which is commonly found around our shores, the stipe doesn't have the anti-fouling that this one does, and it gets covered in seaweeds and other growth. Um, this one was a notable find at Lundy. It had been found for the first time in Britain in Plymouth Sound in 1948. Next. Now, I just thought I'd show you this for amusement. It's not actually taken on Lundy, and I see it's out of focus down here, but never mind. Um, now, this is what we looked like in 1969. This is what divers looked like in 1969. I know it's 1969, next click, next click, because I could afford to buy a contents gauge. In 1968, you just strapped a cylinder on your back, you had a regulator, and you kept on diving until you started to suck on your cylinder, and then you knew it was time to go up. But 1969, I could afford a contents gauge. And this is a photograph taken on the 4th of August, 1969, of that yellow cup coral at the No Pins. This was when I was at Westfield College and the workshop were charged with making me a perspex housing for my underwater single lens reflex camera. And also what I was doing was I was doing surveys which looked at the way in which marine life was distributed um, around the island, different rocks, uh, here's two different sites, the south coast, the southwest coast, there's another drawing, and so on. Uh, sorry, the Knoll Pins and the south coast. Uh, there's another drawing for the east coast, and the, sorry, the west coast, and so on. Very pictogrammic, um, lots of different symbols, which are all explained here, but very early days of describing the ecology of subtidal rocky areas. So I was very fortunate in being there with scuba equipment to take advantage of that gap in knowledge. Next slide. Okay, and underwater nature reserves. Well, um, this is an article which is written on behalf of John Lamerton, Heather Machin, and Ron Machin of the Ufkin branch of the British Sub Aqua Club. So 1969. And here's Heather Machin again. Heather really took the lead. She's Heather Booker now, lives in Lee. Um, <coughs> and uh, here she is. <clears throat> writing in the Journal of the Devon Wildlife Trust at the end of 1969. Um, here's the sort of diving that we were doing in the 60s, 70s and 80s. So we were working out of a concrete hut on the beach, the diving hut. This is the old Schoen, the sort of landing craft that used to operate from the Polar Bear, which was the previous island supply boat. But we were working out of inflatable boats, which we used to take the engine off the back, carry it up the beach, then get half a dozen of us around the inflatable boat, carry it up the beach, and then launch it the next day. That was a very good system, actually. Worked really well. Um, yeah, don't be too premature. <laughs> um, Lundy became one of the best study areas in Britain, especially for subtidal habitats. And we were doing the inventory of the fauna from 1971 to 1980, lots of quantitative sampling, this is the barn, this is the barn before it was converted into that luxury dormitory accommodation. Um, and we had a, a, a laboratory built here kindly by the island, shelves, benches, and so on. 
We were doing all sorts of other studies, for instance, burrowing species. Now, can anyone tell me what this diver is doing? So burrowing species make conspicuous holes in the sediment, but often we don't know what the burrowing species are, they're just holes in the sediment. So nobody's answering. So what you do is you mix some fiberglass resin, you put it in a bucket, and you carry it down and you pour it down the hole. And then 24 hours later, you go back and it's set and you dig it out and you get the structure of the burrow, which could be the burrow of an angular crab or a red band fish. Uh, and sometimes you even get the angular crab trapped in the middle. <laughs> so we were doing other things apart from just inventorying the fauna. Okay, next slide. That's it. And also things like mapping underwater habitats. Now this is um, 1979. And the way we did it then, you can see all the dots on the map, no GPS, no lat longs. Basically, we were going off features about a kilometer or half a kilometer apart. And we were going more or less in a straight line, more or less in a straight line. And we were using a compass, old fashioned Boy Scout stuff, a compass taking bearings on different features and then plotting them on a chart or a map to work out where we'd been and using an ordnance survey grid reference. No GPS, no lat longs. And um, these are our dots. And, th and this is, you did this, didn't you, Robert? Yeah. So Robert uh, produced this um, colored map showing the distribution of different habitat types around the island. And believe me, long time, for a long time, that was the best map we had. We had people coming over with sonar devices saying that they could find out what the bottom type was from the um, reflection of the sonar and so on. Absolute rubbish. We got some uh, totally nonsense maps and it was a very difficult thing to counter because a lot of people thought that any new technology was brilliant. No, it wasn't. It just wasn't working. Um, and I think we got some maps which Really, I hope nobody's going to take any notice of these days. But this was a good map. There are better maps now. There is better systems. And there are some very good maps produced, which I'll show one later, I think. Next slide. We even had a stamp set. We even had a Lundy issue of stamps in October 1978, Lundy Marine Reserves. And these are special species which were um, you know, it used to illustrate the, the stamps. Next one. And we were doing quantitative surveys. We were monitoring change. We wanted to know how stable the populations were, how persistent they were, um, or how they changed. And we were using this sort of quadrat with a, a film camera, of course, um, and, and taking quantitative photographs with this frame, which if anybody wants it, I have at home outside my back gate waiting to be taken by the scrap man. So if anybody wants that frame, do say so. Next slide. Oh, funding ceased after 1986. Yes, a bit of a tragedy. Um, priorities changed. The Habitats Directive was on its way and such like. And basically that monitoring stopped and it means we've got a real gap in our understanding. Next slide. And then up came the statutory Marine Nature Reserve. 21st November 1986 is when it was declared. There was earlier press coverage and so on. The Environment Minister, William Waldegrave at the time here. And of course, this is why Robert was appointed to sort of lead up as, an, uh, as a liaison officer to the, um, de uh, the designation of Lundy as Britain's first Marine Nature Reserve. And now still England's only Marine Nature Reserve. I mean, it's been overtaken by the Marine Conservation Zone designation that's replaced the MNR designation, but this is what happened. Click again, and that was the boundary. So straight line boundary, so that it was easy for people in fishing boats to know where they were in terms of using their deck and navigation equipment or whatever. No GPS. You had to use something called DECA, which, uh, you know, you could work out where you were and what your latitude and longitude were. Next slide. Uh, the Scuba Divers Guide to the London Marine Nature Reserve, which is 2001, um, and which I see there are still copies for sale in the uh, shop. There aren't many left. So if you want a last available copy, go to the shop tomorrow morning. So this was a very good guide. You'll need to flick the pages in the top. But it was followed on. 
but this one isn't available. I don't know, Robert, have you found? We're reproducing it. You're reproducing it. You're re having it reprinted. OK, so this is very good as well. This was done for the 40th anniversary. Um, and it was done by uh, the then wardens, Nicholas Saunders and Sophie Wheatley. And, um, you know, when it's reprinted, it's well worthwhile having. Next slide. And we had the 40th anniversary. So uh, we're now the 50th. And this was Geoffrey Cox, the local MP on board the Oldenburg. Again, the island turned up trumps and let us use the old Oldenburg for uh, the event. John Lamerton, who's now deceased, unfortunately. Myself, this is original people. Um, now, we've got Ty Nigel Thomas in here. He was the first appointed warden, marine warden on Lundy, uh, paid for by the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF. Uh, Nicholas Saunders and Sophie Whe Wheatley, who were the warden and assistant warden at the time. And there's Robert at the, at the event as well. I couldn't get everyone together at the same place. Uh, next slide, please. And I don't want to forget two other key people. Um, Heather Booker, who was Heather Machin, who was instrumental in promoting Lundy, wrote those articles in 1969. And Chris Mandry, who unfortunately also is no longer with us, who always had good ideas and great support over many years. Next slide. OK, so that's what Lundy is now. And this is the boundary map. If you go and buy a copy of the 2001 book, the map is completely out of date in terms of boundaries. But we've got the, we've got the uh, statutory marine, uh, sorry, we've got the special area of conservation. Uh, we've got various areas banned from trawling. We've got the no take zone, which is no, um, no, uh, no, re no removal and no deposition of anything. Uh, and then we've got things like recreation zones or um, anchoring zones and so on. So you've got this, and I'll come back to management plans in a minute. Don't try and read that. Um, but that's the Lundy Marine Protected Area uh, zoning scheme, which is a good way to do things. You know, you allow most activities to go on where they're not really causing any damage, but where the damage is likely, especially off the East Coast from mobile fishing gear, heavy mobile fishing gear, then you do have things like no take zones, what are now called highly protected marine areas. Next slide, please. OK, what's the importance of marine habitats at Lundy? So you've got socioeconomic importance. I mean, there's shellfish and fin food. You know, Lundy is important for those people who catch lobsters and crabs, uh, take whelks and so on. But it's also important for inheritance value and public enjoyment, what you call in jargon cultural services. Um, biodiversity is important for biodiversity and conservation. Seeing habitats as they should be, giving us a a baseline or a marker against which we can judge areas which are damaged. Maintaining a reference point to study change and for comparison of unprotected areas. So we want to know what natural change is. We want to see what's as close as possible to natural and what we should expect to change anyway. Not all change is due to human activities. Not all change is due to climate. Not all change is, is due to um, uh, you know, stochastic events like storms and so on. So I think that places like Lundy help us to have reference sites for that. And of course, comparison for unprotected areas. And why not just because we enjoy them? Next slide. Now, this is the sort of um, image that we can get these days. Uh, absolutely fabulous. I mean, this is a LIDAR image of the island, which is done from planes. And then you've got the underwater sonar image, which is only depth. It's not habitats, it's not areas of sediment. It, the red is shallow through to the blue, which is deep. But you can see it tells us where these rocks are. These are rocks, rocks coming out of here. Um, rocks off the south coast going on to level seabed. Uh, gullies that are well worthwhile investigating. And nowadays, those, of course, are all georeferenced. So you can hover over them with a mouse and you can find out what the latitude and longitude is. So if you want to investigate these apparent rock outcrops well offshore here, then you can hover over uh, one of these um, images and, and you can find out the latitude and longitude. Uh, and it gives you a clear picture that Lundy is very, very rocky on the south coast and the west coast, the wave exposed coast. It's not so rocky on the east coast. The, 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 the rock boundary is quite shallow. 
uh, quite inshore, except where there are tidal currents, where there are tidal races. And then offshore, it's level seabed. It's about the same depth. So that suggests that it's going to be sediment. Next slide, please. But I want to show you this because the old ones are always the best. This is from um, 1869. And when Wheatley said, OK, Lundy, it's a big lump of granite, but only part of it is a big lump of granite. So the magma which came up through the, through the Mort slates, so the Mort slates were there before Lundy was. So the Mort slates um, were out in the middle of the Bristol Channel as it is now, and the magma pushed up through in an egg-shaped mass. So that's the egg-shaped mass. And it, clearly, you know, the southeast corner is slate, the rest of it's granite. But look where the line is. Look where the line is. If you dive off the south coast of Lundy, and if you dive off the north coast of Lundy, you're on slate. You're diving on slate. So that was you know, done a long time ago, but it's right. It's correct. Next slide, please. And landscapes, but also one of the reasons why Lundy is so valuable as a marine conservation area is because it's got such a variety of habitats from the wave exposed west coast. I think this is when my tight fitting hat actually blew off into the water. So if you find a black finsular hat on the shore, then it's mine. Um, next one. And this is what the shores look like on the west coast. Very, very barren. They look very barren. They're limpet barnacle dominated. There aren't that many seaweeds. Uh, this is a transect. You can just see the tape measure there. This is a transect when we did um, surveys of the zonation of four sites um, on the various coasts. And uh, this is Dead Cow Point on the 4th of July, 1977. Um, this is my wife at the time, Sue. Uh, and this is one of the sites I said we shouldn't try and get to, it's too dangerous. Uh, Sue was six months pregnant at the time and we scrambled around to it. And you just did things like that in those days. Next slide, please. And then of course you go to the sheltered east coast and without the very strong wave action, the shores can be dominated by seaweeds. The, uh, there's no transect line here, but there's also a transect which goes up here on the north side of Rat Island. So the north side of Rat Island, covered in seaweeds, very different sort of habitat. And I will say very pointedly here that Sue and I set up those transect sites. They're very easy to refine and relay the tape measures on exactly the same lines and resurvey them. So why is it that when English Nature and Natural England bring their staff over here to do transects, they go to different places? Why don't they go back to the same places and resurvey them? That would make sense to me, but there we are. Um, another tease for Natural England. Next slide, please. And you get the boulder shores. And those of you who went up to Ladies Beach today, um, which I think is this one, um, will complain at me at some time during the trip for sending them along a really difficult walk to get to the shore and boulders that could not be turned. But some boulder shores have got turnable boulders and when you turn over boulders you find lots of interesting stuff. Next slide. And then places like um, Devil's Kitchen and the rock pools. Um, not many rock pools on the granite but on the slate are lots of rock pools and very worthwhile investigating because of course they're wet all the time. So you don't get the dehydration that you get on the, on the open shore. And quite often they're populated with a high variety of seaweeds in particular. So rock pools are very interesting. This of course is um, Devil's Kitchen. You can see the beach hut there and the castle up there. And that's a fabulous shore to explore. Next slide, please. And some highlights from the shore and they're a little bit my selection as it were. I had some slides which showed a massive number of different species and I thought, no, that's too much for my audience um, on uh, Friday night. Uh, so you've got the Devonshire Cup coral. You can find those in quite a lot of places. You probably won't find more than half a dozen on one shore search. But the, the, the prize is the Scarlet and Gold Star coral. Um, there are lots of places on Lundy where you can find this very small coral, um, smaller than the size of your little fingernail. But, you know, it is scarlet on the outside and it's got golden tentacles. 
Um, things like snake locks and enemies, which everyone finds fascinating. Uh, this is the rock pool which we didn't go to at uh, Lamatry Bay. Uh, today I decided that it wasn't safe to go down the rope. Um, but it's a fabulous rock pool, sorry. <laughs> uh, next slide. And then you've got things which really, particularly people on a seashore safari, love to see. They're not necessarily rare, um, but they are you know, rather bizarre. They're not what you would see in a woodland or whatever. Marine life is very different. So there are no freshwater starfish. So, you know, this um, spiny starfish, which grows to about sort of 30, 40 centimeters apart, um, that's quite often on the shore um, at Devil's Kitchen. Um, the green sea urchin, Samichinus, yes, that's another one which you find under boulders. Um, the small cushion star, uh, Astrina phylactica was new to science in 1974 and we've got some very good populations in upper shore rock pools which warm up. It's a warmer water species and it is small compared with the other cushion star and then things like the shore clingfish with its eggs here which again people find absolutely fascinating. Next slide. But more unusual species, things like the solar powered sea slug Elysia viridis which lives on this Codium, which has uh, got a very velvety type feel to it. And those green dots, it's stolen some of the chloroplasts from the seaweed that it feeds on. And it's now, those chloroplasts are continuing to produce sugars which benefit the sea slug. So a nice little story with the solar powered sea slug. And um, stalk jellyfish, yeah, I think people today at Gannett's Rock found three um, stalk jellyfish. They've become unusual in southwest England. They've been in decline all around southwest England, which is a pity. Um, I, I should have asked my colleagues here to look out for the Australasian barnacle. It's got four plates. Other barnacles have got six plates, and it is a non-native species. It's one which has been recorded from Lundy, but I haven't been able to find it in recent years. So my challenge to my colleagues is to see if they can find Alminius modestus, the Australasian barnacle. And then we've got species coming in like the grey triggerfish, which people think are exotic. The triggerfish live in the tropics, don't they? Well, these do live in warmer waters, but the first ones recorded in Britain were recorded in the middle of the 18th century, I think in 1758. So they've been around for a long time and they come across on currents from the east coast of the United States and up from the Azores and Portugal. Um, and then they, they turn up in about June or July, and then come December, it gets too cold for them. And they go comatose, and they get swept out onto the shore and on the strand line. So that's when you find them swept up on the strand line dead. There might be one or two which survive through the winter, but we've never seen small ones, so they don't seem to be breeding. Wait and see. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here's Rosie with her find, the Celtic sea slug. New species to Lundy. So we're not just talking about species disappearing. We are seeing new species which might have been there all the time. We didn't find them. But this is the actual, there's the size of it in, in, in Rosie's palm. But there's the actual creature, a bumpy little Celtic sea slug, which I used to associate with what I call surf beaches. But here it is at the gates and it's been found again this year. Uh, but unfortunately, some things that we find we're new to Lundy, Lundy are non-natives. So this is the red ripple bryozoan. It's a non-native species. This is in May 2021 when we found it for the first time. Uh, this is Rosie shining a torch on it. This is what it looks like. I've been down there yesterday and today and it's now enormously more extensive. It's here for good, but not for good, for bad actually. So we are picking up non-native species that would have come in on some boat's dirty bottom. So some boats are not well anti-fouled, they're not cleaned off, and they have nooks and crannies as well, where things like this encrusting sea mat um, can grow. And then when they get here, they reproduce uh, when their boat's moored up here and, uh, and then settle in things like this dark cave. Next slide, please. Talking about caves. 
people get very worked up about caves. Caves are a, an important feature to designate for protection um, under OSPAR Annex 5. I won't try to explain that. Uh, um, under the Marine Conservation Zone um, Ecological Network Guidance, caves are in there. You've got to be very, very careful. The caves at Lundy, here's one on the west coast, and if you click the button, you can see that we did a survey in 1983 um, of the caves on the west coast, 21 different caves on the west coast. As you can imagine, it was flat calm. We were very lucky. We went into those caves like this, and these boulders, cobbles, pebbles are moving around every time there's a storm, and they're just wiping everything off the rock faces. I mean, the seals like them. Seals use these caves a lot for puffing. Um, but, you know, sometimes you go into them and the boulders are swept up onto a ridge and then behind the ridge, ah, oh, it absolutely stinks. It's full of rotting seaweed and so on. But I'm, I'm sure these caves are used extensively for seal pupping as well. But from the point of view of marine life, no, they're rubbish. Next slide. Uh, underwater landscapes, kelp forest. This is the best, most atmospheric picture I've got of a kelp forest in Montague Bay. 1973, I took that picture, and I haven't managed to get a better one since. Next slide. But here's some uh, seaweed off um, Devil's Kitchen. It could be off the Carmine Philomena off Surf Point. I'm not sure, I couldn't find the original slide. But basically, Lundy has the highest recorded number of algal species of any similar sized location in the British Isles. Um, I, some people might choose to try and beat that and contradict me, but 314 and more uh, species of algae. Next slide, please. And then you get the tide swept reefs. This is hen and chickens, which you know is off the northwest corner. If you watch it when the tide is racing past, it's very, very, very tide exposed. And it's also very, very wave exposed. And you get a restricted number of species which seem to thrive in those conditions. So things like this, these flower head hydroids, tubularia, but also things like Corynactus, the jewel anemone, which is quite widespread, uh, and various other species of um, uh, bivalve mollusks, muscular species, which form dense mats, um, and lots of tubiculous amphipods. Uh, they make muddy tubes, and they seem to thrive in these conditions, but they're probably annual species, uh, an annual. Next slide. Now, a lot of you will have been to the earthquake, because it's quite a feature on the West Coast. The idea that it happened during the Madrid earthquake in whatever year it was a long time ago, it has been completely and absolutely rubbished. Uh, but basically it's the granite blocks falling apart or perhaps a um, basalt dike eroding away. But you know, you get these spectacular looking canyons. Next click, which you also get underwater. So in terms of people exploring underwater, this is the knoll pins. There's a third knoll pin, which doesn't break the surface, uh, to the north of the other two knoll pins. And this is swimming through the knoll pins canyon. But there are lots and lots more canyons on the west coast, and they are quite spectacular. Next slide. And the west coast, the wave exposed west coast looks a bit like this. This looks like a very fragile coral, doesn't it? It's actually a sea mat. Um, and it's potato crisp rhizome, and it is as fragile as potato crisps. If you pull it, it just snaps off. But it survives on this wave exposed west coast. Next click. And also we get the, the pink sea fans there, which here you are, I think this is probably 2015 or something like that. Very good condition. I said they had a disease in the early 2000s. That disease has gone away now, and those which are surviving are generally in very good condition. Next slide. And this is a super picture from 1986. Okay, it's a scan of a 35 millimeter slide, so it's not that crisp. But look, you've got these red sea fingers, you've got a pristine branching uh, sea fan, you've got two other sea fans in the background here, all large, all looking very nice. 1986. And I'll come back to that slide a bit later. Next slide. Uh, okay, underwater reefs, branching sponges, these Axnelli sponges, we did monitoring studies on these, we measured their growth rates, we recorded their position year after year. The same individuals were there year after year. 
The small ones, as well as the large ones, scarcely grew. They put on much less than one millimeter a year. They're extremely slow going. They're very long lived. Um, there are two species here. There's Axinella dissimilis and Home Axinella subdula. And they do not find their way onto any lists of threatened species uh, because they don't fit red list criteria. But they are very sensitive to mobile fishing gear and damage and loss. So um, that's an important species on the West Coast. Next click. Sunset cup coral, we already mentioned far too many times, but that's a, a very important species. Next click. Uh, this far, a rather nice cluster anemone, yellow cluster anemone. Next click. And of course, the spiny lobsters, which have persisted on Lundy, uh, where they've actually been locally exterminated in parts of the Southwest because of overfishing. They persisted at Lundy, and of course, what we've had is a situation where, where they were made extinct um, in the late 60s, early 70s, all of a sudden in 2014, we started to see babies in places where we'd never seen them before, or I'd never seen them before in diving out of Plymouth for 20 years. Um, and now they're becoming not abundant necessarily, but you know, very common in those places where they had been extinct. 40 years on, that's what happens in the marine environment, 40, 50 years on, and all of a sudden they come back. You get these decadal scale changes. Next slide. And this is a picture that Robert took, um, and it shows at the null pins um, four of the five species of cup corals which we get in Britain. So Demonshire cup coral, sunset cup coral, Weymouth carpet coral, southern cup coral, and if you click again, we get the scarlet and gold star coral, which doesn't occur in the subtitle, it occurs intertidally. So we've got all five species of British stony corals. Next slide. Uh, this is just the tide swept underwater reefs. Again, those potato crisps, bryozoans, those fragile bryozoans seem to survive. There are lots of species which occur everywhere, like the spiny starfish and so on. But off the Rattles Anchorage, slate. Not granite, slate. Next slide. And then things to look out for, jellyweed, um, schmitzia. Um, occurs in the tide-swept cobbles off Rat Island, where the tide race is on the north side, near the Carmine Philomena wreck. Uh, something we haven't seen for many, many years. Uh, tasselweed, carpomitra, yeah, we, we see that around Lundy consistently, but it's still an unusual seaweed. We haven't seen this one since 1986, the blue, blue slug sea slug, sorry, the blue spot sea slug. And sea slugs are notorious for disappearing for many, many years before they pop up again. But it'd be lovely to see that one back at Lundy. We know it's 1986 because there was a film crew over here and I said, you must film the spectacular blue spot sea slug. It's only about an inch long. And they said, oh, well, where can we find that? And I found one for them and I put it in a jam jar and that one was brought back and forth to the shore and then taken out and tipped on the seabed to be filmed. But it was the last time, 1986, and I'm not saying we took the last one because it was put back where it was found, that we actually saw blue slug, spot sea slugs. This is a, a novel one. Uh, this is a sponge crab. It actually uses its rear claws to put a sponge or even a, a red sea fingers on its back. This one hasn't got one for some reason, but so it shows up the pink claws, which is often all you see. Um, sea fan poached egg shell, which uh, was kindly named after me because I drew, drew attention to it from um, samples out of Plymouth. I had to collect 25 of them out of Plymouth in order to have the DNA done, uh, and it turned out to be a species new to science. Uh, sea fan enemies, Rowan Holt found these on Lundy many, many years ago, and I trust Rowan's um, observation, but we haven't seen them since, and we hadn't seen them before, so another one to look out for. Next slide, please. Our East Coast sediments, we're getting towards the end of the, um, you know, sort of pictures of Lundy landscapes and so on. You can see a policeman anemone, and it's called a policeman anemone, I'm told, because it's got like a policeman's hat on top of it. It puts its tentacles up like that. They burrow in the sediment, and then there are lots and lots of other species which you don't see. 
with sediment like this, which is a sort of muddy gravel, then you do not see the fantastic variety of species um, which are present in the sediment. Probably about 250 species in total. Next slide. And then there are the most conspicuous species, such as the angular crab, which lives in burrows, harbour crab. Uh, there are scallops out there, um, but you can't take them, not inside the no-take zone. Um, and there are things like red gurnard. And there are other things like butterfly blennies, which I just haven't got a decent picture of. Next slide. But the most spectacular one is the red bandfish. This is Robert's picture. And at one time, there was a population of about 14,000 off the East Coast. We know this because um, uh, people from the Millport Marine, sorry, from the Isle of Man Marine Station came down with their research vessel and their towed underwater camera and they censused the area and came up with a number of 14,000 individuals. They aren't anything like that number now. Next pick. But we do know what they look like. Well, Sometimes they come all the way out the burrow, so we know what they look like. Uh, but this is a rather unfortunate incident because here is a red bandfish which has been caught by an angler off the east coast. You can recognise the sidelands here within the no-take zone. And this was published in an um, angling magazine. And so uh, Mr Watson, uh, together with the skipping, uh, together with the uh, skipper of the uh, fishing boat Anchor Man 3, had some telephone calls from the fisheries authorities to nicely say, were you fishing inside the no-take zone? Don't do it again. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, Rex, Rex, a very particular sort of habitat for seabed species. This is the wreck of the Robert. Uh, you can see the side covered in plumos and enemies, lots of fish swarming around the wreck. Next slide. Um, this is the starboard side. This is the bridge. And you can see the plumos and enemies again. You can see all the fish swarming around. But it is only at 15 metres below extreme low water, so it has got lots of seaweeds on it. Um, and we sampled the fauna quantitatively using a, basically an underwater vacuum cleaner. And with the species which we recorded uh, from photographs and from surveys, we got 280 different species settled on the wreck of the Robert. Next slide. And then you get, uh, you know, classic pictures like this, uh, an exhaust pipe surrounded by plumos, an enemy with a conger eel in the middle of it. Next slide. This is the a boiler of the paddle steamer Iona. Now you might think this is one of the paddle arches, but these are the stoking holes. So these are where the coal was shoveled in uh, to the boiler. So that's one of the boilers on the protected wreck of the Iona II, which was a gentleman's paddle steamer, which uh, was being uh, taken over to the United States, um, perhaps to act as a gun runner during the Civil War. But um, it, they overloaded it with coal. It was never up to the Atlantic gales and so on. And it was brought into Lundy, probably listing and sank. Next slide. This is, well, this is, a, oh, this is a picture of, of a wreck off the south coast of Lundy. Sorry about all the backscatter. I'm afraid that's what you get when you don't angle your flash guns properly. Uh, but you can see again, the boiler holds a part of the oil. This is the Earl of Jersey. This was a tug which in a storm, Lee Rocks is just below the surface, probably, in a, probably as, as high as this church, um, but on an extreme low spring tide and in a big swell, then it would have been dropped onto the top of the submerged rock and basically smashed. So the Earl of Jersey is a, a, a very good dive and has interesting marine life on it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a boiler wreck off Gannett's Rock. Boilers are likely to float away from their actual mothership, as it were. Um, and this is what a boiler looks like. Lots and lots and lots and lots of holes uh, where the tubes went to make the steam and so on. Uh, the stoking holes. But there was a, I can't see it now, there was a hole in the side. And I looked through the side of it and I thought, I can see something interesting in there. Next click. And what I can actually see, and you find difficulty to see it from the back, I could see lots and lots and lots of this southern cup coral, this warm water species, which was only confirmed as being present in British waters in about the mid-1980s. 
So Southern Cup Coral living in this dark space inside of this boiler. Next slide. And of course, open waters are, you know, those of you who go snorkeling in the landing bay, do report these into the Lundy Field Society, lo L Lundy Field Society logbook if you see it. And uh, we want to know how many blue jellyfish you're seeing, how many mauve stingers you're seeing it. Um, I think there are identification guides down at the beach hut, aren't there, Rosie? Yeah. And, and this is a really interesting one. This is tiny. This is the size of your little fingernail. Um, and this is a super picture taken with a telephoto lens from the jetty. Um, Neotaurus, I've got a common name for it. Look out for those. We get a lot of oceanic plankton coming into Lundy. We haven't seen basking sharks for years, but that's the same throughout Southwest England. Now, nine, sorry, 2020, sorry, 2012 was probably the last year that there are any numbers seen. Um, common dolphin, um, you're lucky to see them, but we can see them and you see them especially on the trip back to Ufkum. And Atlantic grey seals, underwater Labradors, that's what they are. Um, and they become very friendly. I think as Robert mentioned earlier on, in the 1980s, you might see one in the distance. You might feel a tug on your fin and look round and see a, see a seal dashing away. Now they're very used to humans and they engage with humans, um, particularly in places like Gannets Bay. But if you're just snorkeling off the shore and if you're careful and take advice, as the tide comes in in Devil's Kitchen, when it's about two thirds of the way in and the seals are coming off their um, sunbathing purchase, then that's quite a nice place to go snorkeling in with the seals, which doesn't involve getting a boat all the way up to Gannett's Rock. That's where this picture was taken. Next slide. Uh, and this picture here taken from a, a, at high water uh, from a, a small cave at, at uh, Devil's Kitchen. Next slide. But a little story here, or next picture. A little story here. Sometimes you see, you, you photograph seals and you should look at their if they got a good picture of their face like that, um, speak to Rosie, because it might be that your photograph will identify that particular individual. Their facial markings are very distinct. This one actually had a tag on it and it settled on the seabed and I took a picture of the tag, number on the tag. It turned out to be a seal called Woody. And Woody was resident near St. Ives on the 5th of June, 2009 seen near to Newquay on the 20th of June, photographed by me at Lundy in late August. Uh, sorry, in, uh, sorry, on the, 20, uh, on the 20th of June, I photographed it at Lundy. By late August, it was back near St. Ives. So Woody came to Lundy on his holiday, or her holiday. Next slide. Why, what makes Lundy special? Well, it's the wide variety of habitats, but it's also the position. We're right at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, this is in December. So in December, the black area is absolutely liquid mud in the Severn estuary. And then as it gets to red, it gets to very high turbidity. It's still high turbidity around Lundy, but the clearer water is off to the west. When you come to the 24th of July, 2006, you can see that the turbid water is just up here in the Severn estuary, Bristol Channel. And when you get to Lundy, you're on blue water, which is the um, much, much clearer water. So we're out in the, at the edge of the Atlantic and uh, we benefit from that. I think, unfortunately, we disbenefit from the fact that those turbid waters are full of nutrients from agricultural runoff, uh, sewage and so on. And I think that uh, some of the reasons for decline at Lundy are because of that high nutrient level. That's a personal view. Next slide. We've also got interesting currents which sweep up North Cornwall, go past Lundy, go along North Devon, and then go out past um, South Wales. And those currents obviously bring up larvae uh, from Cornwall. Next slide. Uh, Rocky Shores, 60 years on. Uh, this is what I've said before, surveyed in the late uh, 1940s. Um, and then we resurveyed them in 2008 published in the Journal of the Lundy Field Society. Uh, these are the sites which um, uh, were visited by the Harveys uh, and which we revisited as far as possible. Next slide. And next click. 
and we'll keep on doing it in a minute. So we can, the feces that recorded in the late 1940s can almost entirely still be found today and we have got additions. Next slide. Um, some species are present in much lower abundance though. Uh, that might be expected on the main. Uh, uh, that might be expected on the mainland, um, and possibly since the surveys in the 1940s, one of the reasons why they're present in lower abundance on the, on the mainland because a lot of larvae are quite short-lived. So if the larvae are produced on the mainland, they might not make it to Lundy. It's too far for the larvae to travel before they settle. Um, so that's quite an important uh, ecological consideration in terms of species recruiting to Lundy. Next picture, uh, there are some, some reductions in abundance of certain intertidal species, such as stalk jellyfish, that have occurred elsewhere, uh, everywhere else. So stalk jellyfish abundance seems to have gone down throughout southwest England. Um, there'll be other examples. Next point, uh, we sampled the fauna associated with coralline algal turfs. It was similar in terms of the species present, but seemed, uh, but, but seemed less in abundance. So the species we found seemed to be lower abundance than Leslie Harvey recorded. Uh, and some intertidal species are increasing in abundance as a result of warming air and sea temperatures. Next point. But there are now significant populations of some non-native species. Next slide. And it's getting a bit tedious now, so I'm going to hurry up. I tried to get a more recent slide than this. This goes to 2005, but it shows you for the relevant area in southwest England how seawater temperatures have stayed much the same over you know, 1905 through to the early 80s, a little bit of an increase in the early 50s. And then zoom, what they call the hockey stick shape to the graph. The, you know, seawater temperatures have risen, but I must say that um, since 2002 in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, seawater temperatures have stayed much the same. So, you know, we're not getting the sort of global warming effect that some other parts of the world are getting. Next slide. Uh, this is one example of uh, warming effects on species. Next click. Um, so in 1980, this uh, tooth top shell, it took us 10 minutes, this is myself and Steve, Professor Steve Hawkins, it took 10 minutes to find one. And now you can find two and more per square meter. So that is a warm water species which has increased in abundance. Next slide. And here's the bad news, not the good news. I've shown you this slide already, 2001. Not exactly the same place, but more or less the same place. This is when this disease kicked in, this Vibrio bacterium which badly affected, conspicuously affected the pink sea fans and probably also sea, other sea anemones and corals, but that wasn't so obvious. So you go from a thriving situation like this with lots of sea fans, big sea fans in the background, to things dying and being covered over with fouling organisms. But that happened throughout Southwest England. Next slide. Uh, what about this one? Yeah, we don't want to see that picture again. Uh, but look at this in August 1984, peppering the rock here, not a very good photograph, but you can see, and then next click, 20th of June 2009, here there were about 56, then there were about 14. The number of uh, sunset cup corals, that nationally rare species, has declined quite enormously. The photographs we took last year and this year show that there are a lot of small ones. So you never know, there might be recovery going on. Next slide. And then we got the plague of non-native species. So Asparagopsis armata, the harpoon weed, because it does have spiky bits which look like harpoons and it harpoons into other seaweeds. It doesn't attach to the rock itself, it attaches to other seaweeds. But this form, the har harpoon weed stage, has only been recorded since 1973 and very sporadically up until the late 1990s. Now it's all over the place underneath the um, jetty in particular. But that was what was found by Claire Harvey in the late 1940s, was a different stage of the same seaweed, these fluffy little balls of seaweed, the Falkenbergia stage. So that's a non-native species, new to Britain, uh, published uh, in Nature, its presence at Lundy was published in Nature magazine, um, 
and uh, first record for, for Britain, but unfortunately a non-native species. We've had Pacific oysters. If you see a Pacific oyster, which is gonna be the size of your fist, take a cobble and smash it, please. We don't want them here. I don't know how they got here. Um, the nearest population must be in North Devon somewhere, but um, I don't think any have been found this year, no. Um, I might have one in that cave which I went in, <laughs> looking at my photographs. Um, a wireweed, a sargassum uticum, it floats, it has air bladders, it carries on reproducing when it's floating, so it could have floated up to Lundy uh, on the surface of the water. It could also have been brought here on the jack-up rig which was used to help construct the jetty because it popped up in 1999, which is about the same time as the jetty was being constructed. But who knows, it could have floated here and reproduced absolutely by itself. Uh, next slide. Gains, good. Lobsters, seven times as many off the East Coast in the survey work done in 2007. Um, this is one at the foot of the knoll pins in an overhang. Uh, when we had a film crew over and they wanted to film a lobster and they said, Keith, where, we can find, where can we find a lobster? And I said, well, I think there's one under a boulder at about 20 metres depth off the knoll pins. No, Keith, we need to know where one definitely is. I wasn't allowed to say there might be, so watch out for film companies. But I said, all right then, let's go and have a look. And fortunately it was there and that was the one. Uh, next slide. So that's just the graph which shows, compared with um, what they call control sites, which are really reference sites on the mainland and in South Wales, um, you can see uh, in, from 2004 to 2007, you know, an enormous increase in the number of lobsters being caught um, by experimental traps off the east coast of Lundy. Next slide. That's the work going on. Next slide. And that's a catch from 12 pots off the east side of Lundy from a gigantic uh, to undersize. Next slide. And that sort of survey is going on again. This is a study being done by Plymouth University. Um, and this is a lobster which has now got a, an adhesive tag on it, not a, a, a tag which is stuck into the flesh or anything like that. It's really for fishermen recatching them, not for um, you know, divers seeing them and being able to read the very small writing on, on there. Um, so there's Ben Benji holding up uh, from experimental catching in 2022, an experimental study. Next slide. Uh, this is, I've told my colleagues I want to go to Brazen Ward because I want to retake this photograph of these branching sponges, which um, are very long lived and very slow growing. And you can see I took three pictures, pasted them together. I want to retake those pictures and I want to see whether exactly the same sponges are present in exactly the same place. It's not a difficult rock outcrop to find. Um, my instructions tell me to kneel 60 centimeters away from the rock and have the lens set at 14 millimeters. So um, I'd very much like to do that. Next slide. Scallops, this wasn't taken at Lundy. Scallops, very tasty. Um, scallop dredging off the East Coast used to take place, but not very much even before the um, no-take zone. Next slide. A ridiculous study. Those who like statistics um, will know the problem, that they were basically using this two metre long pipe and swimming along and counting the number of scallops which they saw. And what they discovered when they got the results was that they could not they, they could not possibly have taken enough samples in order to produce a statistically valid analysis. They would have to take an enormous number more samples. Well, that's a trouble with statistics. Next point. Um, if you collect scallops, if you actually see them on the seabed, lift them up and measure them, um, then you might get a much more effective measure of how many there are within and outside the no-take zone. Uh, but it's not a study which has been commissioned for some reason. I mean, I think it's because sometimes our colleagues in the nature conservation agencies get too hung up with needing statistical accuracy instead of meaningful counts. Um, uh, you have got to have the right sharp eye to see scallops. No good if you haven't got a sharp eye. Next slide. So Lundy's marine protected area, where we are now, where are we now? You can see we're near the end and I'm, I'm near the end. Uh, long, well, what, what have we got? 
We've got a long history of study that informs the management of the area. It's a special area of conservation. It has a no-take zone. It has protection for spiny lobsters via a marine conservation zone designation. It has a management plan for the marine protected area. It is subject to condition assessments by Natural England. That's for the special area conservation. It encourages activities that help visitors enjoy and find out more about the area. You know, we do want people to enjoy the area uh, and not just to feel that they're being stopped from doing things. Uh, it provides facilities for research. It enables commercial fishing for lobsters and crabs outside the no-take zone. It enables angling outside the no-take zone. Next slide. It has a management plan. Now, when I give my annual lectures to master's students about marine conservation, and I get to the point about marine protected areas, and the Lundy management plan is just about the only management plan which I can recommend from Britain. There are management plans in the USA and Australia and New Zealand and so on, which I can draw attention to, but the management plan for Lundy, 2017, uh, it has a goal, all projects, all good projects should have a goal or an aim, and it has objectives. They're not actually called objectives, but it has objectives which are uh, quantified or can be followed up. So it has objectives which can be tested uh, to say whether they're being fulfilled or not. Uh, and that's, that's very important. And, um, you know, it's, it's very surprising that other marine protected areas don't have uh, this sort of management plan. So it does act as an example and a model. And there's its um, strap line is respect, oh, sorry, respect, protect, enjoy. So that's what Lundy's all about. It's about respecting the area, it's about protecting the area, and it's about enjoying the area. Next slide, please. And this is a book which you can buy in the shop, uh, History, and I, uh, History and Marine Life Highlights from the 40th anniversary of the Marine Protected Area. But a lot of the, most of the history in there is bang up to date. Next slide. And then if you want to find out more about history and wildlife at Lundy, including looking at the Lundy Field Society Journal and the Lundy Field Society Annual Reports, uh, then go to the Lundy Field Society website. Join the Lundy Field Society, kept up to date, keep up to date with natural history on Lundy, uh, archaeology and, and so on. Next slide. And most of all, have a good time on Lundy. <laughs> Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we're going to have time for two or three questions, so does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask you? Or anything I've got wrong which you object to? <laughs> yeah? Well, it's got to be the Sunset Cup Coral, hasn't it? <laughs> I found it. It's rather lovely. It's an absolutely fantastic part of Lundy's underwater scenery. And, um, you know, we need to look after it and better understand what's happening to it, why it's shown such a decline, and hope that it'll just come back of its own uh, volition, as it were. I, I think it had some fantastically good year for reproduction and recruitment. Either a whole lot of larvae, a whole swarm of um, young fish in the plankton landed on the east coast of Lundy, uh, settled there. They were, they were almost all large individuals, I think, and um, that makes sense. But there's been a dribble since then, so I'd be surprised if there aren't red band fish off there now, but not 14,000 by any means. Um, so I think it's one of those sort of stochastic uh, recruitments which occurs, it occurs on the land as well. Sometimes you get, you know, a massive influx of a species. You don't see it again for 50 years. Perhaps we'll get another massive influx of red band fish. But that's my thought is it's just a, um, a one-off large recruitment. Sorry, what's what? This is the harpoon weed. Oh, this is oh, asparagopsis, yes. Um, 
You can answer that. <laughs> because Sherry is doing a, um, a study at the moment uh, looking at the impacts of um, uh, non-native algae uh, at Lundy. But that was a very unfair question, Sherry. I'm not going to follow it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the algae, for instance, now we've got different non-native species. If you look over the jetty, you'll see the uh, wireweed, Sargassum muticum, which has air bladders and it just floats up. And studies in California of the same species, which is non-native there as well, have demonstrated that it doesn't actually have much of an effect on the native species because it floats up and the light still gets the native species. Now, something like Asparagopsis, in the numbers that it's present, or the abundance that it's present underneath the jetty, I think could actually be smothering the growth of native seaweeds. It doesn't mean that the species will, the, the native species will disappear. It just means that the numbers might be reduced or the abundance might be reduced underneath the um, blanket of uh, the Asparagopsis, the harpoon weed stage of um, Asparagopsis armata. Uh, but I think that remains to be seen and hope best of luck, Cherry. <laughs> I think the um, red ripple bryozoan appearing here is much more of an issue because although it seems to occur in shaded wet places, um, it does smother that and it will stop other species from settling uh, on those surfaces. Very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, funnily enough, when it was first suggested, they were in favour of it. I mean, the Devon Sea Fisheries Committee, as it was, you know, sort of were drag kicking and screaming to the idea. Um, and they said, oh, well, you know, this will take about five years to sort out all of the uh, complaints and issues and objections and so on. And the fishermen more or less said, oh, yeah, we don't mind. Yeah, go on, do it. And all of a sudden we had a no-take zone and we didn't have any sort of before studies. So ideally you'd have sort of before studies to look at the abundance of lobsters and to look at what was living in the seabed and, and so on, pre-disturbance uh, or pre-prevention of disturbance. And then all of a sudden you had a no-take zone and you had to jump to it and, and do, some, do some studies uh, to set a baseline. Um, so the fishermen were in favour and they're still in favour because they can see that there are bigger lobsters and bigger female lobsters mean more eggs, mean more larvae. And they believe that the no-take zone has actually led to an increase in the abundance of lobsters in particular in their catches um, in North Devon and of course on the west coast of Lundy and so on. So I think fishermen are perfectly in favour of it and it's a good example to other fishermen who might be objecting to uh, no-take zones, highly protected marine areas. Right. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much indeed, Keith. Very informative, enthralling talk. Very good. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming along. I do hope you all have a chance to investigate what else the Marine Festival is offering this summer. So uh, do uh, read up and look at the website as well to find out what else we've got planned. But uh, otherwise, thank you very much indeed for coming along. Hope you've enjoyed the evening. Good night.